Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of March 23rd, 2020. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael on Tuesdays from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, also on the new Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, our review of the Senate budget bill passed on Monday, and more importantly, where we go from here. Second, the clearer the picture we have of the economic effect of the oil price drop and virus, the more bleak the state's long-term financial numbers are looking. And third, our first take on the effect of the oil price drop on Alaska oil development. And now, let's join Michael. Let's take a crack at what's coming up here on number one. Number one, of course, I'm assuming is going to be uh, the budget, this four point whatever billion dollars of mess that we've got here. Uh, hit us with your thoughts on it. Well, so let's let's sort of get the status of the budget down uh, first. Uh, yesterday was sort of a, a rocket day. The, the Senate uh, voted on the budget. Uh, uh, there were amendments made to the budget, um, the operating budget, and, and the Senate's combined really the operating and capital budget together. Uh, a, a starter, what they call the first phase of the capital budget together. That went back to the House. The House, uh, at, for concurrence, if the House concurred, then the budget was adopted. That budget would be adopted and go to the governor. The minority voted for uh, uh, to concur because it contained the, the two $1,000 payments. The majority voted against concurring. Um, so that sends it back uh, to the Senate for one last look, um, the Senate will reject it because it's because what's going back is essentially the House budget. The Senate will reject it, and then it goes to conference committee. And the House already named well, actually, actually, it already goes to conference committee. The House named its conferees um, yesterday. They are uh, the two House Finance co-chairs, Neil Foster and uh, Jennifer Johnston, uh, and then the senior. Uh, a minority on the House Finance Committee, Kathy Tilton, um, and the Senate will name its today. Uh, according to, to form, it will likely be uh, Bert Stedman, the co-chairs of the Senate Finance, Bert Stedman and Natasha von Imhoff, um, and then the senior minority member, which will either be Donnie Olson. Um, Donnie would be the senior one, but Donnie got excused from the legislature yesterday, and it's not really clear why. Um, or uh, Bill Wilikowski, who's the other minority member on House on Senate Finance. So it, it'll be in a conference committee that will um, uh, be looking at, at trying to resolve the differences. The House, as you will recall, had no PFD in their bill uh, and no additional $1,000 payment. Uh, and you look at the conferees and the conferees, the, the six conferees, takes a majority to move it out. You've got uh, uh, Neil Foster and Jennifer Johnson from the House and uh, Bert Stedman and Natasha Von Imhoff from the Senate. You can sort of guess, I think, right. what, uh, what, what, what is going to happen to the PFD in there. Right, what direction that's going. We already can read the, read the tea leaves on that one. And so that comes back. That bill will come out, back out of conference, um, and it will go to both bodies for an up or down vote. Uh, the, the one... And and you would assume that since they represent the majority, that the majorities will vote for it. The the thing that hangs then, I think, is the CBR draw because they're going to need a CBR draw, or they will they will propose a CBR draw, uh, presumably as part of financing the bill. And the question is whether the uh, whether there will be a portion of the House Republicans, sufficient por portion of the House minority, 
that votes for the CBR draw. So the, the bill's far from over. Uh, yes, the Senate um, did add those two $1,000 payments in it over Natasha and Burt's vote, by the way. Both voted against it. <laughs> yep. The uh, the House um, uh, uh, the House minority tried to concur, uh, didn't. Uh, the majority uh, overruled that concurrence, and so it's off to the conference committee and then back. So, yeah, it yes, there was there was a there was a big plus yesterday in terms of in terms of the PFD votes, um, but uh, it's it's far from certain that they're that they're going to survive. The other thing about the budget is, and, and this is sort of, I mean, we sort of gone, have gone into stealth mode because of, because of how quickly this is, this is moving now. The other thing that happened um, in Senate finance um, and, then, and then, was, then was ratified on the Senate floor was the operating budget went up, uh, unrelated to the PFD issues. The operating budget went up by about $100 million. Um, the governor's original proposed operating budget was 4.44 million. The House came in at 4.45, uh, close to the governor. Now, now remember, we only have three billion dollars in revenues. Right, that coming in, right? Here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but the House came in at 4.45. Senate came in at 4.54, uh, 100 million dollars above the House. Um, and there's there's several things that explain that. The Senate put back in uh, the um, Thirty million dollars uh, that 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 had been bandied about for K through 12 in previous legislatures had been advance paid. Uh, it was part of the controversy in last session about whether uh, whether the the House could the legislature could constitutionally uh, advance pay or advance commit uh, 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 payments to the to K through 12. That's still in the courts. Uh, the Senate put back in the 30 million dollars for this year. Uh, to the um, to the for K through 12 to the operating committee uh, the operating budget, and they also uh, reduce the cut or increase the payment, increase the allocation to the university system. Right. Um, how much did so, they, How much did they put back in on that, Brad? Because this is 25 uh, million this year, right? Yeah, I think it's I, I think it's in the teens. I think I think the the additional numbers in the teens. Um, like twelve is what hits me. I can I can look it up here. That's just curious. I was just curious for my own sake. But, but they but they put back in additional money for the university, and then there's other things that they that they added back in. So that four point five four million. I mean, if you look across the years, FY nineteen, which was Governor Walker's last budget, was the operating budget was four point five seven. Last year, uh, the operating budget coming out of the legislature was four point two two. Uh, but we've had a bunch of supplementals that got it added back in. Um, the governor's proposed budget this year was 4.44, House 4.45, and now the Senate's up to 4.54. So they've they've the Senate's back to very close to where the the last Walker uh, budget was. It's, it's fairly well wiped out all of the any reductions that were done, um, long term reductions that have been done in the last couple of legislatures. Um, so it's it's I mean, as I say, it's sort of it's sort of the stealth budget because uh, it came so fast as we as we as we've hit this crisis, it's come so fast. You really there's not a whole lot of good uh, press or discussion about it, but but it's gone up significantly even before uh, the uh, the thousand dollar payments. Well, and it's gone up. And, and of course, the second thing is, is that gavel to gavel is no longer uh, in the building. Uh, they've got robot cameras or something going on in there, and so uh, there's no real uh, there's no real oversight. Uh, they've got they've got some video, but it, it, that's it. And the 24 hour rules in place, and I mean they're doing all this other kind of stuff. So yeah, stuff is happening rapidly and kind of behind the scenes, uh, while nobody is real. Everybody's watching what's going on with the pandemic, and nobody's really paying attention to what's going on in Juno. Yeah. So as far so the so the budget's far 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 from over. And and I think the, the the sort of the one last stopping point on this because again, uh, it, you can sort of imagine what's going to happen in the conference committee. Um, the one last stopping point on this is going to be the the minority Republicans, I think, with the with the CBR um, uh, vote, and um, it's going to be an interesting. Um, I mean, so we've already we've already had one of these votes. It was the CB. They tried to put the CBR draw. Um, and the reverse uh, uh, the reverse sweep into the supplemental 
bill that's still hanging out there someplace. Um, and uh, the they had the they had the vote on the CBR draw for that. The the House Republicans split, uh, but there were still enough in the minority between that and and some absences that were in the House at the time. Uh, there was enough to stop the CBR draw, the, the commitment for the CBR draw at that point. Um, we'll see what happens uh, in the next in the next few days. I suspect the conference committee will be rather rapid on this. I mean, there's there's alignment between House leadership and Senate leadership. What happened yesterday was the Senate body didn't agree with Senate leadership. Right. Uh, but but there's alignment between House leadership and Senate leadership and the finance committees. And so I would anticipate the conference committee would be fairly rapid in in pushing it back. Well, and part of the problem here, of course, is in drawing from the CBR, it requires a supermajority vote. They could draw from the ERA, but that would basically be uh, admitting to all Alaskans that they lied to everybody when they said they had to follow the law, well, at least this one law, uh, and making it happen. And then, of course, the other thing that's tied to this whole thing is the reverse sweep as well. Um, which uh, would mean that all those monies would be swept from the various accounts into the CBR, including a billion dollars in the power cost equalization fund, which may not be a bad thing at this point. And if the Republican minority can hold on to those things and utilize those as leverage tools, uh, they might be able to, you know, get some concessions out of this deal, do you think? Yeah, the the, the reverse sweep, the reason, the, I, I think, the, revi- the reason the, the Republican minority members of the Republican minority uh, voted to uh, voted against the CBR draw to protect, to, to stop the reverse sweep at that point was because you could look at the re- the things that are being reverse sweep like PCE, you could look at them as savings accounts. And instead of drawing from the CBR or drawing from the ERA, use those additional pots uh, as save as, as savings and draw from them to balance the budget from them and not have to pull down the CBR further and not have to have to pull on the ERA. Now, of course, there are powerful interests in the legislature uh, that would oppose that. But right. but but there but but that's I mean, that's why you hang on. That's why the House minority hung on and opposed uh, the uh, the CBR draw. So it's I, this is not all played out yet. Um, and it's going to be interesting to see how the house minority uh uses its leverage from the cbr draw to try to uh to try to uh affect change how how the budget's going to play out of course the majority and and is going to be pleading to the press that the minority is uh playing politics in the time of of crisis of (laughs) the virus and and you know they're opposing things that we need for to, to keep Alaskans healthy during the virus, they're going to get they're going to get inundated with with attacks like that. But that's that's the power they have the, over the CBR and trying to affect change in terms of preserving uh, the the PFD or in terms of using other uh, these other savings accounts, what you can view as savings accounts to uh, to fund government instead of ERA draws or CBR draws. Uh, that, that's where the that's where the game's going to be uh, this week. And just for folks who understand out there, I mean, Alaska is a state whose constitution does not re- does not allow for a dedication of funds. And so when we say, you know, all these funds are out there, the power cost equalization fund, the higher edu- the education higher endowment fund, all these different various pots of money that are out there, these monies have been squirreled away into these accounts over the period of years. And at the end of every year, there's a sweep that sweeps all the monies into the CBR Uh, to pay back the CBR and do what it's supposed to do. And then there's the reverse sweep, which essentially moves those monies back out of the CBR into those various pots. And there are, I can't remember what the last count was, Brad, but I think it was like something like $1.8 billion in these various funds that are just sitting out there in those pots of money. Am I I close to that? I think it was something. No, I haven't updated the number recently, but I I, I won't argue with that. I mean, that sounds sounds, uh, reasonable. Yeah. yeah, the, the, I always chuckle when when you know Lyman and others go on and on about the PC the PCE's protected. You can't the, the legislature can't appropriate it, and it's de- it's designated for this purpose. It's designated by statute in exactly the same way that the PFD is. Right. Exactly. Um, it's it's not. I mean, it's treated by the legislature as either or treated by legislative finance as either dedicated general funds or designated general funds or 
or other in exactly the same way that the uh, the PFD was uh, through uh, 2017 until Natasha and Bert got uh, 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 ledge finance to, to change the designation. It, there's no difference right. uh, uh, in those designations. And yet they, they go on and on and on about how these are, you know, how the reverse sweep, the failure to do a reverse sweep is horrible and all these things are, you know, are sacrosanct. And yet they, they stand on the same statutory ground that the PFD does. Right. And so it, it, is a, it is a pot of money that we have available to us that could be used to fund state government for another year uh, while we deal with this crisis. Uh, I mean, but the, the bottom line is we're running out of money. Even if we took it for this year out of the PCE and other uh, various pots of money, we still only have about $1.6, $1.5 billion in the CBR. And so it would only buy us the breathing room until next year. Uh, maybe until the point to where we could see water above what's going on with this virus and we could figure some things out. But we're looking at some tough years ahead. There's no doubt about that. Oh, we're looking at horribly. I mean, that's what the second segment's going to be about, about, you know, a presentation that that Ledge, fin, uh, Ledge Finance made on Saturday. We're looking at, at horrible numbers uh, as a result of the changing economic conditions. And, and yeah, we are just putting this off. We, we're, if we do draw down, um, uh, savings to, to you know get us out of this budget, or we do cut the PFD. We're, we're just we're just you know putting off the inevitable. It's it's coming at us fast. Yeah. We we we've gone through you know 17 billion dollars in savings between the statutory budget reserve and the constitutional budget reserve in the last eight years. Um, we have no savings. We have virtually no savings left, and uh, and and the situation has gotten worse, not better. Yeah. than what we faced the last eight years. The problem is, again, we have no dedicated funds in the you know per the state constitution, and yet these politicians have become masters at squirreling these things away, slapping a name on them, uh, and then allowing the monies to uh, sit in there, and then you know preen about as if uh, well, we can't touch those because those are for higher education, those are for power cost equalization for the Bush, those are for this and that and the other thing, and we've got you know again. billion dollars squirreled away in all these various accounts, which we sweep and sweep, sweep in and sweep out every year, Uh, especially when we're up against a crisis. I think that the reverse sweep should have a good hard look, Brad. Well, yes, Um, uh, and and Donna, who's who's listening on in on this call, tried to tried to generate that good hard look last year by uh, by uh, not including the reverse sweep as part of the. As part of the uh, as part of the final appropriations bill, um, and and we saw what happened with that. I mean, we saw the explosions that happened with that. And we saw the, the the creation of the recall Dunleavy effort and 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 everything else. I, yes, I mean, all of this, Michael, <laughs> de- deserves a good hard look. That's that's been the sum and substance of our last eight years together <laughs> talking talking about it on this show. I mean, the university deserves a hard look. Medicaid deserves a hard look. K through twelve deserves a hard look. All of this deserves a hard look and yet the legislature under the current leadership is not uh, is not doesn't want to give it the hard look I mean and 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 wants to continue these pockets um, and and until you change the legislature um, you're we're not going to get those hard looks I mean Lyman Hoffman is just so well positioned uh, as part of leadership, he just goes back and forth. He's part of whatever majority forms, whether it's all Republicans or 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 bi bipartisan or whatever it is. Lyman's already always part of the majority, and he's sitting there protecting PCE as his as his personal accomplishment in life. So, um, yeah, we, we, yes, all all we could cut spending. Yes, you and I have agreed to that. You and I have outlined how to do that over these last eight years. Yes. Uh, the PCE is subject to is subject to appropriation, just like you know we, they've they've now made the PFD subject to appropriation. Yes, you could you could do all this stuff, but but until there's a political will to do it, um, it doesn't. It, it's just theoretical. It's not it's not practical. So um, it, it's a reason to change the legislature. It's a reason to change legislators. It's certainly a reason to change legislative leadership. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but but until that actually happens, it's we're not getting any. Now we're moving on to number two. Number two, Brad. So number two is is how bad things look uh, going forward. I mean, we th- this this budget that we're dealing with right now is just a moment in time, but. 
we really need to be focusing on the next 10 years and, and, and where we moved into. Legislative Finance made a presentation, uh, the Legislative Finance Division made a presentation before Senate Finance on Saturday that I think is is a key uh, presentation that people need to focus on. There's an article about it by James Brooks in yesterday's uh, Anchorage Daily News. The title is Pressed by Cor Coronavirus and Falling Oil Prices, Alaska is Running Out of Available Cash. Um, the the and I've and I've posted uh, the uh, the legislative finance presentation on uh, our SlideShare page. It's slideshare.net. Look for BG Keithley and you can find uh, the legislative finance division uh, presentation. The legislative finance division the 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 ledge finance presentation was biased in this in this sense. They treated the PFD as uh, as just government revenue. Uh, they didn't even they didn't even make a feint toward uh, trying to carve out the portion uh, that under current law is supposed to go to the permanent fund dividend and go out to citizens and the portion that goes to, and the remaining portion that goes to government. They didn't even try that at all. They just blew past that intersection and treated the entire per, the entire POMV revenue stream um, as government money. And so their view of the of the situation was was bad um, and shows that Alaska is in in a dire situation but it's not but it was it was muted somewhat by sort of the 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 the, the absence of a PFD the absence of carving out anything for a PFD yesterday um, we posted uh, Alaskans for sustainable budgets posted at the same slide share page um, a, a relook at the ledge finance numbers, uh, but carving out uh, the PFD, and and it shows um, just a dramatic effect of what's going on uh, currently. What ledge finance did that was good on Saturday was they started to take into account the effect of $40 oil and $35 oil, and as importantly, the effect on the permanent fund dividend or the permanent fund and the POMV draw as a result of declining stock market prices. Um, and it showed it showed the, the combined effect of those over time. So for example, uh, under, and this uses the, the revised look that we did uh, taking into account the, the permanent fund dividend. So for example, the, the fall forecast, when you look at the fall forecast and you assume the PFD is equal to 50% of the, of the uh, POMV draw, so it's so effectively POMV 50-50. You look uh, into the fall forecast uh, with oil prices uh, at $59. Um, we've we've got a we've got a huge problem. We've got a 1.11 billion dollar average deficit uh, over the next uh, 10 years, uh, but and that and that's at $59. But then you start getting into um, the, the situation is we're, as we inc increasingly find it today, um, and that is, uh, let's say, the, the next look that legislative finance did was oil at $40 with a steady recovery by the stock market from whatever level we fall down to uh, in, in the midst of this crisis. Um, and that's sort of their middle case, uh, budgeted or oil at $40, steady recovery. Um, then... And, and this is using spending at uh, the current uh, current levels plus inflation, uh, which is reduced from you know the track we've been on. But nevertheless, current current levels plus inflation. Then the deficit goes from the average ten-year deficit goes from 1.11 billion dollars to 1.84 billion dollars, um, 700 million dollar increase uh, effect in the in the average deficit over the next ten years as a result of going to 40 dollar oil. Um, and sort of steady recovery uh, from the stock market drop, and that 1.84 billion is roughly um, uh, uh, oh, probably 40% uh, of spending. Then Ledge Finance did another uh, uh, analysis with oil at $35 a barrel over the next decade, and a slow recovery by the stock market uh, uh, investment market from. What's happening under the uh, under the virus, um, and the deficit goes from remember it's gone from 1.11 billion dollars over the, for the uh, over the next 10 years under the fall forecast 1.84 billion dollars 
with oil at 80 and a steady recovery. Now with oil at $35 and a slow recovery in the stock market, the deficit goes to $2 billion per year uh, over the next uh, over the next decade. And that's with the POM or the PFD at at 50 at POMV 5050. It's not even the statutory PFD. If it was the statutory PFD, that deficit would be $700 million higher. So it'd be $2.7 million. The, 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 the takeaway from this, Michael, and people need to focus on this. The takeaway from this is, is we have hit a paradigm shift in Alaska. The effect of dropping oil prices and to some degree, the effect of the stock market, although that's not really as huge an effect, uh, certainly not as huge an effect as the oil, oil market. Uh, but to some degree, the effect of the stock market ha- has opened up what otherwise was already going to be a very difficult situation um, into sort of this yawning chasm, this yawning canyon um, uh, cliff uh, out out in front of us. Um, and we're, we're going into it with 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 no savings. I mean, right. we, we've, we've gone through the CBR, we've gone, we've gone through the SBR, we're about to go through the CBR. Even if we you know, hit PCE and all these other pockets, buckets of money that we've stowed away out there, it's not getting us through this. Um, and so it's, uh, it's just another confirmation that we've hit a paradigm shift. We're either, we're either going to have a massively lower level of government spending, and we saw last year when the governor tried to do it that way, uh, or we're going to have uh, continuation of taxes, the continuation of taxes. We've already had taxes the last four years in terms of PFD cuts, the continuation of taxes, but deeper taxes. I mean, these 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 deficit levels uh, overrun uh, even the uh, even the P, uh, the PFD. So it's um, it, it's a it, it's a it, it, it's a very difficult situation we're going into and people need to start getting their their heads around it, even when get through the budget this year, next year's budget, the year beyond that, the year beyond that, the year beyond that, the year beyond that are going to be worse. Um, and and we have to confront as a state how we're going to pay for that. A lot of people, Natasha, Bert, Senate, current Senate leadership, current Senate leadership uh, wants to wants to do that on the backs of middle and lower income Alaska families by uh, by continuing PFD cuts until the PFD runs out. Um, Others, uh, including me, want a more broad-based approach so that all Alaskans and non-residents contribute to the to the cost of the state, lowering the the impact on any given Alaska family by broadening broadening the base. Um, and 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 that should be the debate. That sh- that that yeah. should be the debate, as opposed to just assuming we're going to do it through PFD cuts. That should be the debate. Well, and I mean, the long and the short of it is here, Brad, and we're down to about the last 68, 70 seconds here. But the long and the short of it is. We're looking at bad days ahead, and we've just refused to kind of look this. I mean, not you and I, but the the leadership in this state has refused to look this in the eye, and we're up against it here. Uh, 60 seconds here. Give us some wrap-up. I know we didn't get to number three, but we'll hit it at the top of the hour. So go ahead and give us a wrap-up. Well, well, the wrap-up is is we, the, the, the debate needs to shift. The debate needs to shift from these sort of year-to-year battles to, you know, what what fund do we raid? Uh, or, or do we take it from the ERA or not? The debate needs to shift to the current generation needs the current generation of Alaska needs to pay its own way for government. And the question is, are we going to pay for it on the backs of middle and lower income Alaska families through PFD cuts, or are we going to pay for it in a more broad based manner so that all Alaska families and non residents contribute toward the cost of the state? That's the debate we need to be we need to start having intensely uh, as we go forward. And, of course, the big news as well is with oil prices and everything else, investment in the state is going to decline. We'll see production go down. We don't know how the stock market's going to rebound after this virus is finally put to bed. Uh, but based on uh, past epidemics like uh, the Spanish flu, it, it could recover, uh, but it'll have some lingering effects. It's going to affect us, and we still don't know what that's going to be. Give us a, a shortened version of number three over the next four or five minutes. Yeah, I do. Um, so... We sort of we sort of talked about this to some degree on last week's show, but after last week's show, there was an article that 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 hit the Alaska Journal of Commerce on Wednesday uh, by Elwood Bremer entitled "Conoco Phillips Oil Search Cutting Alaska Spending by 270 Million Dollars," and then following that, there were other articles about Oil Search, which is an Australian-based company, in the Australian press that talked about the situation that Oil Search uh, is in. All of those are posted on. Uh, on our various uh, uh, Facebook pages. Um, 
basically what what we what we're seeing is at least oil search which which is important because of its role as operator of the pika project uh the 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 great new project that people have been focusing on on the north slope uh that oil search is going into sort of a very um uh not a lockdown maybe maybe but maybe a hunker down uh, mode of its own it has um, it's just going to slash its capital spending. It's going to slash the spending it's doing uh, in connection with the PICA project. It's going to stop its efforts to sell a portion of the PICA project, which it had underway. And the reason you do that when you go into hunker down mode as a corporation is because you don't want to sell something to somebody uh, and, and lead them and, and have them think that you're going to you know, develop it. Uh, you don't want to make any commitments. They, they would a buyer would ask for commitments that you're going to go forward and contribute your share, so they're actually buying into a real project as opposed to just giving you money. Um, and you don't you you stop those sales because you don't want to make any commitments about what you're willing to do going forward. So, there, oil search is going into a hunker down mode. And if you read the Australian press, uh, financial press about oil search, uh, there's some problems there. Um, one article by one of the lead Australian uh, financial uh, papers uh, talked about oil search being a takeover candidate, that, that it's getting so weakened, its balance sheet is so weakened that it's a potential uh, takeover candidate. So I, we're, we're going to see the contraction of the effort around the PICA project uh, likely resulting in delays of, of, of the time and possibly – uh, the delay of the project. It sort of it depends on where oil prices go and how oil search comes out of this. Uh, but but that project is no longer a sure thing. Conoco much more robust, much in a much better position to weather this storm. But nevertheless, um, as Elwood talks about in the article, is cutting back on its uh, capital spend as well, slowing down um, its projects on the North Slope. Still going forward with them, not going into hunker down but going into uh, a, a much more conservative approach uh, to development, again, driven by oil prices. Conoco's really, I think, I think you can say that their, their thinking is this oil storm will abate at some point, um, and they want to sort of continue spending through this uh, to be able to take advantage of it, advantage of it when we come out of the other side. Uh, but they're not going to bet all of the, they're not going to bet the farm on that. They're not going right. to continue at the capital spend rate that they've had. Right. Well, and I think that's the that's the thing that that people are really not even talking about in the legislature right now is, you know, where things are going production wise and what's going what the effect is going to be. I mean, she uh, Natasha mentions it as one of the legs of the kind of the tr the tr the hat trick from hell. But uh, this has got longer term effects, I think, than even any of the other aspects of the virus or anything else, because, the, you know, the legs on these things, these are the lead times on this is we're talking about five to ten years. And so these kind of things fall apart here, and we're looking at real detrimental effects that we may not even see the end of for a decade. Yeah, and they lose initiative, they lose momentum, um, and and so even if oil prices start coming back, uh, maybe you look at other projects as opposed to this project. It's not it's not a good situation. And if oil prices stay down, these projects, um, the Pika project may not pay out. So it's, you know, the 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 legislative finance presentation on Saturday was bad, uh, was, was, was an eye opener. But if you start to assume that some of the production volumes late in this decade that we've been assuming would show up, if you assume that if you start looking at what the effects of if they don't show up uh, and that production isn't online, um, it gets worse. Um, and so we really, we, we really need to be having a come to Jesus moment talking about how we're going to finance ourselves uh, going forward um, in in the wake of in the wake of what's really a changed world, um, and we don't have the we don't unlike in the in the 20 teens we don't have the luxury of this of this huge savings cushion to sort of bridge over and allow us time to think about it uh, over a number of years. We've used all that up, um, so now we're going to have to confront it without having without having that cushion, uh, and that's a that's that's a dramatically changed environment for Alaska. I don't think Alaskans have caught up to it, um, and but but we need to start catching up to it r rather rapidly because 
because this the next legislative session is going to be the one where we're going to have to confront it. Matt in the chat room says, I can still remember the budget analyst and economist telling the legislature a dozen years ago that what they were doing was unsustainable, yet here we are 12 years later and they still haven't done anything. I mean, that's, yeah. you know... <laughs> And, and it's and it's simply it's simply I mean I go back to the fact that that even the Republicans wouldn't back up Dunleavy on his cuts. I mean, yep. Even the Republicans wouldn't back him up on on the cuts to the state state arts council of all things. Right. Um, it it's 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 that it, yes we've been telling the legislature it's going to happen, but constituents have been saying I don't care I still want money. Um, <laughs> and, and legislators have been responding to that. I mean it's on us. We, we're the ones that have got to stop, you know, saying we want more money. Right. Absolutely. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budget. You can find him out on Facebook. I shared his uh, slide deck here on the show. You can find it in the chat there and everything else. Brad, thank you so much for coming on board. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.